Thank you very much. We are living in a golden age of uh, research into black holes. Two of the last five Nobel Prizes in physics have been for research in black holes. This signals the fundamental importance that black holes have in our deepest understanding of physics and of astrophysics. And it also signals the great advances that we've made over the last decade or two into research in black holes. Now, one of the reasons that black holes hold such an important place in physics and in astrophysics is that they are fundamentally different to everything else out there. So those of you who are interested in astronomy or have some passing uh, uh, experience with astronomy will know that there's all sorts of exciting and interesting objects out there. We live on a planet that goes around a star. We're in a galaxy. There are supernovae. There are all sorts of phenomena, astronomical phenomena out there. You could take all of those phenomena and you could put them in one group over here and black holes are in a completely separate group all on their own. They are completely different to all other astronomical objects and I'll try and uh, ex explain to you why during the process of this talk. Because of this or related to this, they hold the promise for understanding the next steps in the development of our understanding of the cosmos, the next steps in developing our understanding of physics. Essentially, the universe as we understand it in the present day is described by two great theories, general relativity and quantum mechanics. And in black holes, those two theories merge and they teach us that one or both of those theories cannot be correct. And the next steps in our understanding of the universe will be found um, in studying black holes. So I will begin uh, with a quote by Kip Thorne, who won the Nobel Prize in 2017 for his part in the discovery of gravitational waves from the merger of two black holes with the LIGO gravitational wave interferometer. And in a nutshell, Kip Thorne says, why are black holes so different from all other objects in the macroscopic universe? So by macroscopic here, I mean everything that is above the scale of quantum mechanics, which we heard about earlier. So everything that you see and touch, as far as you're concerned, everything in the universe is the macroscopic universe. Black holes are fundamentally different to all of these objects. So let me start by trying to describe, <clears throat> excuse me, what is a black hole. So this slide here, this is black, this just represents space. A black hole is a separate region of space. So I'm going to draw this red line, which I'll come to in a moment, and this delimits a region which we call the black hole. The region inside the red line is the black hole. Now this region is almost entirely empty, okay? As I'll describe on the next slide, we create a black hole, or a, a black hole is created by forcing a certain amount of mass to compress down to a certain density. This creates the black hole around it. All of that mass in the process of the creation of the black hole ends up a single point inside the black hole, and yet we have this space all around it. This space is completely empty. If matter falls into the black hole, it passes very rapidly from the point of no return in entering the black hole to the point at the centre. So a black hole has no surface. The black hole is just a region in space which is almost all the time completely empty. So how do we form a black hole? So I think the common perception is that uh, you form a black hole by putting enough mass together and it will create a black hole. It's not, it's related to this, but it's not quite as simple as this. In fact, what you need to do, as I just alluded, is you need to take an amount of mass and you need to compress it below a certain size. And this size is a number called the Schwarzschild radius, and in fact, it's been known for just over 100 years now. So you, anything can be turned into a black hole. So I give you a nice example here. This is the pale blue dot on which we live, the Earth. If you took the Earth and compressed it until it was two centimetres across, then the Earth would form a black hole around itself. And in fact, what would happen is that that Earth, which you'd compress down to two centimetres, would then collapse down to a, a tiny point. All of the mass of the Earth would be contained in a region which had essentially no volume, no size scale. So you can see here already, you get a feeling for the fact that there's some, going to be some problem with our understanding of normal physics with black holes. 
And around this remnant of the Earth that's down to an infinitesimally small point, there would be an event horizon, there would be a region that we call a black hole that would be two centimetres across. So what really defines this region then? So I have my region, which I call a black hole, and I have the whole of the rest of space, which is outside the black hole. And in this region, in the whole of the rest of the space, which is also the space in which we are sitting right now, or standing right now, um, the escape velocity is less than the speed of light. So you're all aware of the concept that the fundamental upper speed possible in the cosmos due to relativity is the speed of light. Nothing can move faster than the speed of light. And in the normal space outside of a black hole, you can move around anywhere in the universe um, uh, at sub-light speeds as long as you have enough energy and enough propulsion. However, inside a black hole, the escape velocity is greater than the speed of light. And this means to escape from this region, you would need to be able to travel faster than the speed of light, which is fundamentally impossible, as we understand physics right now. And this means that when the black hole forms, this region of space is entirely cut off from the rest of the universe. Not only can you not get out on your super powerful rocket, but light cannot escape, information cannot escape, nothing can escape. And this boundary, this red line which I'm showing on these slides, this is the thing which we call the event horizon. Now it's important to stress to you that this is not a surface of any type. In fact, for the largest black holes, you can actually cross the event horizon without noticing anything particularly dramatic, but you would never be able to get out again. So once a black hole forms, this part of the universe is entirely cut off from the rest of the universe. There is another very important point in a black hole, which I've already alluded to, which is right at the center, which I illustrate with this green circle and cross here, and this is something which we call the singularity. So all of the mass that went to producing your black hole and all of the mass which subsequently crosses the event horizon ends up at the singularity. But there is no force known which can actually stop the distances between the gravitationally attracting particles or bits of matter going to zero. So what happens at the singularity is that everything goes to a point which has no dimensions, no volume. All of the mass is at a single central point, and that can't be right. So we know there must be some law of quantum gravity required to explain what goes on here, but we've never been able to see a singularity, so we're not able to test this. Interestingly, intriguingly, the other point in our universe where there is a singularity is if you take our universe, you take the space-time of our universe and rewind it 14 billion years to the Big Bang, the instant, the very instant before the Big Bang, the universe was in a point that was a singularity. So there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of intriguing connections there between what must lie at the centre of a black hole and the beginning of our own universe. Okay, so I want to make a diversion for a moment into ordinary matter in order to illustrate the fact that black holes are very, very different from ordinary matter. So the number of pieces of information typically required to describe a small lump of ordinary matter is given by this number on the screen. It's a six with 23 zeros after it, and it's called Avogadro's number. I think you'll have put, some of you will have heard of it. This is a number which was announced back in 1860. It's been known for a long time. And the reason I say this corresponds to the amount of information is that this corresponds to the number of particles which make up about one gram of ordinary stuff. And each of those particles can be described by a few more numbers. So I can multiply this by a few more numbers, but it doesn't really matter. So all macroscopic material has an enormous amount of information which describes it. So here's an example of macroscopic material. This is my dog, Brandy. This is his beloved, one of his beloved tennis balls. He is a macroscopic object. The number of particles, the number of pieces of information required to describe him is mind-bogglingly large, this kind of number, as it is for me, for you, for everything we see around us. And of course, we're familiar, as I say, with why this is so because we're familiar with the concept that Brandy, his tennis ball, and everything else around us is comprised of these enormous numbers of small particles, of molecules, of atoms, and the most fundamental particles, like electrons. So we're used to this idea that the whole of our universe, our macroscopic universe, has to be described by vast amounts of information. 
And now I want to explain to you why a black hole is fundamentally different to all of this. A black hole, as we observe it from the outside universe presently, and I make observations of black holes, is entirely described by three numbers. There are only three things we can measure from a black hole. And what's more, in a classical description of a black hole, it's not that there are things we can't measure. There really is nothing else. So a black hole is entirely described by its mass, its spin, and its charge. Its mass is obvious. Its spin is a real thing. A black hole can rotate. And its charge here, we're talking about its electric charge. Okay. So now you may even be thinking, well, OK, he says it's simple. It's only three numbers. But somehow, those are going to turn out to be complicated numbers in some way. But they're not. This is all very, very straightforward. So here, I give the numbers associated with a famous black hole in our galaxy. It has the classic name, Cygnus X1. And its mass is given by the number 12. The units are solar masses. It doesn't matter. It's 12. The mass is 12. There's nothing else to it. Its spin is 0.9. We measure spin in terms of a non-rotating black hole has a spin of 0. And a black hole that's rotating as fast as possible which we call a maximally rotating black hole, has a spin of 1. Our best estimates currently are that the black hole in Cygnus X1 has a, a spin of about 0.9. So it's rotating quite fast. It could rotate a little bit faster, but it's spinning pretty fast. The charge is 0. There's a fundamental reason for this, which is the electrostatic force between positive and negative charges is so strong compared to all the other forces in the universe that you can't separate charges and keep an electric charge on anything for very long. So these charges immediately bring themselves back together and neutralize themselves if they're ever separated. However, mass, of course, only has one sign. As far as we know, there's no negative mass around. So this is why, even though it's a weaker force, it dominates the evolution of the universe. And here's the funny thing. As far as we know and as far as we can tell, in fact, as far as we predict, all black holes in the universe will have a charge of zero. So in fact, they're really all these black holes are entirely described by just two numbers. So you can see that this is fundamentally different to all macroscopic existence around us, me, you, everything that's in this room. So let's have a look then. Let's have a recap or an illustration of some of the physics puzzles which are associated with a black hole. So we have this event horizon, which is the boundary of a black hole. And we know, I make observations directly of this phenomenon, we know that stuff falls into black holes. And this is stuff of your normal macroscopic universe with vast amounts of information encoded in it. And when this stuff crosses the event horizon, all of that information is lost. So that's a bit of a puzzle, and that's a little bit annoying. Okay? Secondly, we know that at the singularity, all the mass, as I've suggested, is compressed down to a region with no volume. So you're essentially, you have a force where you're dividing by zero. You get infinity. This cannot be right either. So we have a couple of major fundamental physics paradoxes here associated with the black hole. The event horizon appears to eat information. The singularity appears, in fact, does violate general relativity. And a unified theory of quantum mechanics and and gravity must be what is required to, to, uh, to understand properly black holes. OK, these are, not, um, these are not abstract concepts. You'll be aware that we've been studying black holes throughout the, uh, with increasing uh, uh, precision over the last century or so. And in the last few years, as I suggest, we've been getting closer and closer uh, to, uh, to observing them and understanding them. In 2019, the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration produced this extraordinary image. This is an image of a supermassive black hole in a galaxy called M87. And what you are directly observing, this dark region in the center, this is the event horizon of a black hole which weighs more than a billion times the mass of our sun. And the glowing stuff around it, this is hot gas close to that black hole. This year, the Event Horizon Telescope produced, revealed, a second image of the event horizon of a black hole. This is now an image of the black hole at the centre of our own galaxy called Sagittarius A star. If you look at the physical scales associated with these two black holes, they're very different. This black hole weighs about six billion times the mass of our sun. This black hole is about a thousand times lighter. 
and this affects the size of the black hole. This black hole, the first one observed, is considerably larger than our entire solar system. You see a tiny circle here which represents the orbit of Neptune. The black hole at the centre of our galaxy would just about fit within the 88-day orbit of Mercury as it orbits the Sun in our solar system. And yet there is another scale of black holes which actually permeates our entire galaxy and our entire universe. And these are the so-called stellar mass black holes. So stellar mass black holes have masses of around 10 times the mass of our Sun, and that means they're about 30 kilometers across. That is, you have 10 times the mass of a Sun compressed down into a region that is smaller than a large city on the Earth. And our best understanding, in fact, is that there are about 100 million of these stellar mass black holes drifting throughout our own galaxy. So what does that mean for the prospects of us directly in situ exploring black holes, perhaps in the next 200 years or so? So the Gaia satellite has mapped out the very near space environment of our sun. So the figure you're seeing now on the screen, this is not an artist's impression. This is an actual map of all the stars close to our sun. The sun is at the centre. There's a couple you'll have heard of on here. It's Alpha Centauri and here's Sirius. We know so much about these stars that you'll even notice that some of them have green circles around them, which means that we know that there are planets going around these stars. Okay, so this is an actual map of the stars close to the sun. If we zoom out a little bit, we have a map of all of the stars within a region of radius 10 parsecs. That's about 30 light years from the Earth. So it just so happens that in studies myself and others have done, we have worked out that the mean separation between black holes within our galaxy should be about 10 parsecs. This means that somewhere in this space there is a black hole. This doesn't mean we need to be afraid that the Earth or the solar system is going to be consumed by a black hole, but what it does mean is that perhaps on a time scale of maybe two or three or five hundred years, if the Earth and civilization survives, we should be able to directly send probes and explore a black hole. Now, if that sounds far-fetched to you, um, I'd remind you or tell you that there are private, there are well-funded private companies right now which are designing missions to send very small probes to the Proxima and Alpha Centauri system very, very close uh, to our solar system. And it's on a similar sign of, kind of scale that we expect to find our nearest black hole neighbours. So I will leave you with the thought that I think, you know, as long as we can keep the human race going, we should reach for the stars and I think that in studying, in finding a nearby black hole, and in sending human-created probes to that black hole, we can probably solve or find our way to making the next breakthrough in fundamental physics. Thank you very much for listening.